Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you can enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, AKA wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear, I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, natural or painted. Today, the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint. Just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sargent made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s. So John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. Guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. Love that pale veininess. Number eight, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755, for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. They were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pale pop, but the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic, and a dimple patch, oh, well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. Number seven, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't wanna see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I do it for the clicks. I do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them. Like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot. I don't know. You put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. 
Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. Item number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Item number four, five head. Let's go back to the renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. Suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. Item number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. 
For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dress with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number nine, tiny tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know, because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. Number six, pearly blacks. Here's another beauty trend brought to you by the horrifying things we as human beings can do to a mouth. In Japan, there's a practice called ohaguro, which just translates to blackening of teeth. Japanese women would essentially, over time, dye their teeth black. 
another dual purpose as it was thought to preserve teeth in old age and was seen as a sign of beauty. Something that separates humans from beasts, or so they thought. The dye itself was similar to some inks as the process involved dissolving iron, vinegar, and some oils. After this process, a concoction is made that is a non-water soluble and acts like a dye when applied to the teeth. Yet again, as a semi-charming internet host, I am going to pass on this opportunity. Plus, who am I to judge? Japan has given us lots of fun stuff, lots of great stuff. They're awesome. Mario, Zelda, Little Mac? Basically, I'm a Nintendo nerd, so I could never speak ill of the land of my favorite games. Even if the whole black teeth thing only ended like 150 years ago, which, when you think about it, isn't that long ago. Number 5. Rationing Legs World War II was a war fought everywhere, and that includes at home. Go ahead and ask your grandparents what it was like. It was only a nickel for a bus ticket, and the movies had newsreels, yes. It's 3 o'clock and I'm ready for dinner. See, that's what they say. Go ahead and ask them, they'll tell you. Well, okay, Grandma. But on a serious note, people had to ration food for the war effort. They also had to ration other goods that you might not expect, like ladies' nylon stockings. In Britain, nylon stockings were all the rage, but the materials for such were needed for the war effort. So the Gravy Browning Company came up with a bright idea, just paint your stockings on. Some women actually did this, and sometimes would even draw on the seam with an eyebrow pencil just to make it look like the real thing. Ooh. However, I just cannot see this being a great idea. I mean, it rains a lot in Britain. Would it not just wash off? What if I get sweaty running for my bus because I'm late for work? Yup, this is another one I'm just going to have to pass up on. I'm sure the pain was 100% safe for body application as well. It probably wasn't. Number 4. Bad Hair Days Alright, this one is generalizing, but hear me out. When was the last time you thought about haircuts in the past? Yeah, see, you don't. That's because they belong in the past. I'm talking about popular hairstyles from the 1950s to 2000s, because honestly, there was a lot of them. And honestly, what were we thinking? We are a species that has left our own planet through science and technology, yet we come up with hairstyles like the beehive, the mullet, everything in the 1980s, and the most heinous, atrocious hairstyle ever, frosted tips. Sorry, Guy Fieri. The list goes on, but my point is people fully went out in public with these crazy hairstyles. I, myself, may or may not have sinned and maybe had frosted tips at one point in my life. I maybe had a button up shirt with a blue hot rod flames on it. But I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you the complete truth. After being a part of this trend, I can firmly say I no longer want to participate in any more bad hair days or blue flamed shirts. Number three. You do what with my wee? Back to the Romans again, and back to the pee. At least the Incas were keeping it outside the body. I, I guess. Romans wanted a clean mouth, and there wasn't any minty fresh mouthwash to reach for. So, what do you use? We. Lots of wee, specifically Portuguese wee. It was just the most sought after. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like there was more wine drinking than water drinking in Rome, more than people would like to admit it. So, if that is the byproduct of all that wine drinking and you're giving that a swish in your mouth, well, all I can say is I'm just gonna give that a big pass on playing spin the bottle. Number two, my little weight loss friend. Okay, I get it. It makes perfect sense. The numbers add up here. But all I'm gonna say is, the chief knows medicine, and he said this is a hard pass for me, and it ain't it. If you want to shed that extra winter weight and be beach body ready with minimal effort and still enjoy deep fried chocolate bars, then you have only one thing to do, and that is swallow tapeworms. Where a tapeworm will grow inside your body and help eat those unwanted calories. Trouble is, you can get very sick, and if the tapeworm attaches itself to something that is, well, vital for your living, you're going to have a bad time. You'll get sick. Just don't do this one, please. Don't swallow tapeworms, please. Don't do it. Number one, I spy some great complexion. Arsenic cookies. I'm just gonna be blunt with this one. Women were eating arsenic cookies for their complexion. You could straight up just walk into a Sears in 1902 and just buy some. It says it's safe on the box. For people who aren't familiar with arsenic, it's poison. Spies often carry one in pill form to unalive themselves in case of capture. At this time in history, it was no secret what arsenic was. This is just kind of weird, like putting ketchup on your eggs, kind of weird. That's just a joke. We're having a debate here in the office and I'm just curious to see who does that. But back to the poison. It was not safe and over time, with lots of exposure, you can get very sick. It's arsenic, it's poison. Don't do that one either. Why? That's just wrong. 
Oh man. In 10th place, we have How to Cure Hair Loss. So while technically this is a top 10 list, I might be cheating that a little bit today. When I was doing my research, I came across so many different ways throughout history of attempting to cure hair loss that I knew I just had to share them with y'all. So there was no way I was gonna limit myself. Let's start off with, uh, 50 BCE Rome. So Romans who experienced hair loss tended to rum myrrh into their scalps, which sounds simple enough until you learn that other Romans tried a more drastic remedy, which involved burning a donkey's genitals to ash, which was then mixed with the urine of the person losing their hair and applying that mixture to the head. Moving on to Egypt. Donkey hooves, dates, and dog paws would be ground together, mixed with oil, cooked, and rubbed on bald heads as an ancient remedy for hair growth. A medical script known as the Ebers Papyrus offers a different recipe for Egyptian hair loss, mixing fat from a hippopotamus, crocodile, male cat, snake, and ibex, which is then applied to the scalp. If that doesn't work, the follow-up solution is to boil porcupine hair and apply it to the bald areas for four days. Finally, in ancient Greece, if women were going bald, they sometimes used a hair mask consisting of a mix of feces, urine, and menstrual scarletness. Okay. Hippocrates endorsed a mix of pigeon droppings, opium, horseradish, beetroot, and spices as an ancient remedy for hair growth, while Aristotle recommended goat urine as a treatment instead. Um, I'll pass on all fronts, thanks. In ninth place, we have separating lashes with a safety pin. This is probably the most modern trick on today's list, and it comes courtesy of film star Audrey Hepburn. She liked to darken, plump, and lengthen her lashes like the best of them, and she had one trick to ensure that her lashes looked naturally fanned out and clump free, and it wasn't, you know, some sort of magic mascara wand. After applying a layer of mascara, her makeup artist, Alberto De Rossi, would take a pin and meticulously separate every single lash. Just for a fun little reference, the upper eyelid alone has an average of roughly 70 to 150 lashes, making that undertaking quite the long and possibly, you know, dangerous process. To prepare for the undertaking, it's recommended to curl your lashes first to make things easier. One must start at the base near the waterline and pull the pin through to the top, separating, yep, each individual lash. So this defines each lash, as well as helps to distribute the dark mascara pigment more evenly. Once you complete the first eye, repeat on the next, and then proceed to your lower lid lashes if, you know, if you'd like. I'll stick with an overall, like, lash brush, thanks, and, like, my reliable false lashes. That's good enough for me. As much as it hurts to yank out the occasional lash from lash glue or liquid latex, at least I'm not risking, you know, stabbing my eye. Trust me, I'm a heck of a klutz. In eighth place, we have geisha beauty. So during the Heian era, geishas would blacken their teeth using a mixture of oxidized iron fillings steeped in an acidic solution. One of the main reasons for this practice was the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded as immensely pretty. And unlike the Western ideals that folks like myself have been raised with, that's just how things were there. The women used to remove their heavy makeup with a nightingale poop, which apparently did wonders for their skin. The active chemical in the bird poop is guanine, which allegedly cleanses the skin and rejuvenates it. Now, geishas aside, Back in the day, the beauty of Japanese women was often judged on the basis of their hair length, and the ideal length was considered two feet below their waist. I don't want to think about how long it would take to brush hair that long, never mind the hairballs that would form. Or mats. Nah. In seventh place, we have the use of copper. So copper apparently has many benefits for the skin, one of which is that it can help to heal wounds and scars, along with having anti-aging properties. Ancient Egyptians used a lot of copper for their skin. And according to modern dermatologists, copper peptides are well known in the skincare world. So apparently I've been hiding under some sort of rock. They improve skin, including firmness, smoothness and reduction of fine lines and wrinkles by promoting collagen, elastin, and improved antioxidant activity. Just a little note though, too much copper intake can make you nauseous and give you gastrointestinal issues or, you know, cause serious organ system toxicity. Good news, I'm not gonna freak out my gold-loving dad today by replacing silver with copper as my favorite metal. Honest to goodness, even just choosing to have fake silver ornaments on my Christmas tree over gold last year almost started a full-blown argument in Canadian Tire. It was the whole thing. Number six. Boots with the fur. Most of you probably love a good pair of apple bottom jeans and some boots with the fur. But for our Silver Fox audience, they may remember a pair of denim that was more sinister. Bell bottom jeans. Yes, that's right. These pants were wild to say the least. While its origins may be rooted in the Navy and sailors, their rise to fame was during the 60s and the white powder fueled 70s. Remember disco? I know, right? High platform shoes, bell bottoms, and leisure suits. Although I can't lie, I feel like I look pretty good in a leisure suit. Just saying, I don't know. This is just one of those beauty trends that we thought looked good, but in reality looked really strange. I'm sure that'll never happen again though. Not like the trends and fads that we had today will ever go out of style. We'll all be looking back and laughing at the silly things we wore, right? <laughs> oh man, I gotta clean up my closet. 
Are we still gonna be doing Fortnite dances then? I don't know, we'll see. Number five, a whole lot of man. Well folks, I haven't done much traveling in my time, but it looks like I know where I'm headed next. To the body tribes of Ethiopia, where, ladies and gentlemen, it's men of my proportions that are most attractive. <laughs> the men of the Bodhi tribe participate in beauty pageants of sorts, where the winner is declared a hero, and every girl in the village wants to be with the rotund hero. The men isolate themselves away for months at a time with no physical activity. Honestly, for a World of Warcraft player, isn't that hard? Where the men consume a diet that's high in fat to, well, make them fat. What's on the menu? I'm so glad you asked. Well, since the Bodhi tribe has such a great grasp on agriculture, the men drink cow's milk mixed with blood. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. After enough consuming of the milkshake from hell, the men's stomachs get fat and the gawking commences. I'm more than just a cut of meat, ladies. You can't just treat me that way. Number four, shark girls. All right, when I was researching this one, I could barely even look at the footage. I was literally cringing in my chair. And this is coming from a guy who likes the Star Wars prequels. Yeah, I know. There's certain women of tribes around the world who have teeth like jaws that are considered beautiful. And I mean the shark, not the James Bond villain. The process of sharpening teeth is quite, uh, well, interesting to say the least, as it's performed by dentists, and I would hardly call them dentists, as they use rocks and chisels to acquire this acquired look. Did I mention there's no anesthesia for this cosmetic surgery? All jokes aside, this is just a lot, and I actually get lightheaded just thinking about it. We gotta move on to the next point before I lose my lunch, or I pass out. Uh. Number three, the George Costanza. Today, every girl wants those long, luscious locks. No split ends with healthy hair and just a radiant glow. But women in ye olde Europe were after the chrome dome kind of look, if you know what I'm saying. They had their hair pulled back, revealing a large portion of their forehead. Hey, look ladies, not that there's anything wrong with balding. It happens. I'd be very ignorant to say that it might happen to me too. It could, when I get old, it'll probably happen. I actually know a guy who's balding right now. Shout out to him. It's just strange how something that could be considered not beautiful today was all the rage back then. Queens literally sat down on their chairs and said, give me the George Costanza look, please. I'm feeling like a real winner today, Jerry. Number two, burn it off. In ye olde times, medicine wasn't great. That's no secret. And sometimes these trendy medical practices crossed over into beauty. What do I mean by that? Well, nobody's perfect, right? We've all got bumps, bruises, blemishes, zits, pimples, scars, moles, spots, freckles, skin tags, eye bags, boils, bunions, warts, dark spots, and some emotional damage that a therapist or a bottle of vodka could not fix. However, when people in the olde times needed to remove any of the list I just mentioned, besides the internal suffering that is chronic depression and anxiety, they use hot pokers. No, that's not medicine, but rather the same kind of hot poker that you put in a fire. They were used to burn whatever it was that, well, needed to be burned off. Yes, burned off. While still a medical practice, imagine how beautiful you would feel after your least favorite spot got burned off in excruciating pain and probably causing an infection. Are you ready? Here it comes. I'm gonna do it twice in this list, but I'll let you guys finish it. Are you ready? I spoke to the chief and he said, it's not it. There you go. Hey, you said it. Let's go. Number one, glowing teeth. Teeth are important, and this is a reminder that you should go to the dentist, stop putting it off, seriously. Healthy mouth is gorgeous for everyone. So that's why you'd want to use Doramand, a radioactive toothpaste. A what? Yes, a radioactive toothpaste, coming full circle with the radiation today. This stuff was what it said on the box. And this one literally did say it on the box, it was radioactive toothpaste. Like that was something to brag about or something. I don't need to tell you why that's wrong, or unhealthy. You may as well just sit in a room and leave an x-ray machine on all day at that rate. Only minty fresh toothpaste for me. Number 10, face off. All right, so it's the 1900s, and technology has gotten good since the 1800s. That means a better life for everyone to enjoy. One such advancement was in women's cosmetics. Introducing the Radia, a brand of makeup that's formulated to make you glow, ladies. And if you don't glow, you can't shine. The secret ingredient, radioactive materials. I honestly can't believe that this one is real, but yep, here I am. Yes, their makeup products contain concentrations of radioactive material to give you the facial boost that you need. Tighten the skin, get rid of wrinkles, and literally make you glow. I'm not a doctor, and you probably aren't one either, but 
I don't think I have to tell you that applying nuclear material to your face every day before work is not a great idea. In fact, it might be a speed running strategy to see how fast you can end up in a hospital for radioactive sickness. I read a report from the chief who's a nuclear scientist and he said that's not it. Number 9. Nail Biter There's a short amount of time on the clock. The scores are tied and your favorite team's player steps up to the pitch, plate, or wherever they need to be. Beer sweats begin to drip down your face onto a jersey that should have been thrown out two playoffs ago. The nachos and chicken wings that were once plentiful on your coffee table now lay barren with emptiness. This is what most sports fans would call a nail biter. But all Super Bowl predictions aside, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in ye olde times, trimming their nails. How else but with the set of pearl chompers the Lord hath given you. That's just how people did it. Yes, that's right, they bit their nails off. Which even today is kind of gross. You gotta use the old noggin for a minute and think about how clean people's hands were. No running water, no modern toilet paper. Ooh, stinky. That is not a win-win situation. That is, that's actually a lose-lose situation. Don't do that. That's gross. Number 8. Mini Brows Back in the oldie times, pale skin was in. And so was dark eyebrows. How to achieve such a complexion? Well, bloodletting for the skin, but I've gone over that before. Something a little more heinous was committed to make ladies' eyebrows look luscious. Mice. A lady's best friend, right? Yeah. Besides some French rouge and ivory teeth, a common beauty practice was to have mouse furs as eyebrows. This is just wrong on so many levels. Mice are just gross as it is on a regular basis without them being on your face. But my question is, was there like a mouse hunter or like, was there a mouse farm? Or was the buddy just scooping up mice out of the gutters and skinning them and then, uh, here you go your highness, here's some fresh mice skins. Ooh, yuck man, no. Number 7. Pucker Up Hey, on this channel we've talked about some crazy stuff in history, and a lot of crazy stuff unfortunately had a lot to do with women being hugely mistreated in the past. However, some women acted against this. I'd give specific reasons for wanting to get back at the patriarchy, but I'd be here all day. One woman came up with a devious plan, a way to remove the stinky men from her life and to get away with it too. Introducing Aqua Tofana. It was an odorless, colorless poison that was slow acting and would resemble side effects of a sickness, or at least a common sickness at the time. It was marketed as a cosmetic. Women could wear this on their cheek and when the big hunk of a man came in for a kiss, well it was probably one of the last things he would ever do. The main ingredients were arsenic and nightshade, which if you didn't know is very poisonous. Next time you forget to take the trash out at night gentlemen, just take notice of when the wife wants to give you a kiss. It could be your last. For that. Number six, lip paint. Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women of the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I applying? Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ugh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel, and nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. 
I want to watch this on DVD. Let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used Deadly Nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible. Let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes Deadly Nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly Nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't. When in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well, don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs, in this century or the next. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. Tiny waist wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint, figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian bent. Big old booty bend, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever, because that's obviously not an option. Corsets would move your organs around slowly and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye opening. And finally coming in at number one, deodorant. What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not, nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdry, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck, but how did we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course, that was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife. So around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. 
they would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? or have this done. I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells, and when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells, can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. This is so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. 
This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good, that's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years. The bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like a, basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a sh I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never-ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Number 10, golden hair. Hair is important. Imagine how different George Clooney would look if he was balding. Ooh. You gotta take care of your hair. There's nothing like treating your scalp to a nice scented and moisturizing shampoo. The Incas thought this too. And reach for the next best thing. Fermented pee. Oh yes, that's right. Basically, you take a pot, you put some wee in it, and let it sit for a week. Why not? Want to stay smelling fresh, of course. I'm not sure if this would make your hair silky smooth, as I'm not frankly in the market to try this. And this one, I can firmly say that if you try this one at home, stop it. Get some help. Don't do that. We belongs in the toilet, not on top of your head. Stop. 
Number 9. What a crock. As if urine in the hair wasn't enough, this beauty trend comes at you from the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans and the Greeks were the peak of ancient civilizations, built beautiful monuments, and were honestly just so smart. So smart. So smart that when they saw crocodile dung, they knew right away it had some beauty properties that they just couldn't pass up. They would bathe in crocodile dung. That's right, bathe in crocodile dung. Known for its restorative and anti-aging properties, I'm just not sure how this works really. Did they like heat it up or something or did this like slip into a tub with a pile of like lukewarm unlawfulness? And how do they really know it had de-aging properties? I'm starting to think this knowledge might be related to the whole urine shampoo thing. This is also gonna be a hard pass for me, no thanks, I'm, I'm good, no, no, no poo in the hair. Number eight. Beauty is pain. Ladies, we all know sometimes beauty is pain. It can be a lot or even too much sometimes. But how far are you willing to go for a little extra beauty? In ye olde times, pale skin was considered to be beautiful, but not always the easiest to obtain. Makeup is expensive and was made of lead and other lovely materials. With all that makeup being caked on, that had to feel lovely on your face. So what's the next best thing? Bloodletting, yes, that's right. In order to have that healthy twilight pale look, women found themselves relieving themselves of their blood. Bloodletting was used for other medical reasons at the time as well, but why not get two birds stoned at once? Stay healthy and achieve that beautiful complexion. I unfortunately pass out at the sight of someone else's blood, so the loss of my own just to be pale would not, would not bode well for me. I will have to hard pass on this trend as well. Plus, look at these rosy cheeks. I don't want to lose that. I think it makes me look cute. Number seven, mice flavored toothpaste. It's ancient Egypt. Life is great. You got the pyramids. You got the Nile River. And you got some guy who claims to be a doctor and he's pulling out the brains of your last king through his nose so he can be mummified for the afterlife. That's just awesome. Just another day under Ra's warm sand. Egyptians just knew how to live and they knew dental hygiene was important. So they came up with toothpaste. Sore tooth? Try this toothpaste. What was this toothpaste made of, you ask? Well, it was made of crushed mice, of course. Ugh, God. I mean, here I am thinking that just some herbs crushed up with some water would be fine to eliminate bad breath, but after all, having nice teeth and nice breath is sexy. So, the Egyptians took some mice and they crushed them up with other ingredients in what must have been the most foul and rancid concoction this side of the Nile River. Just go ahead, put that goop in your mouth. You'll look okay, you'll look great after. Oh, just brush it on there, smells great. Oh, that's amazing. Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. Back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. Spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. 
Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is, hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are massive excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault, with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it. Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. 
So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot Topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house, as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. Not just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visee, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Evers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that shit, put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mixed in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the fuck that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription. You're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. 
Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The the mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine, and I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops, and what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods, how in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know, how? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss 
was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches, the early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't wanna be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching Western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ha ha ha, though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably, I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, <laughs> so you're like, why did you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so 
taboo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. In sixth place, we have Egyptian makeup. Look, everyone knows about ancient Egyptian using coal around their eyes to shield against the sun, deter flies, and overall just look stunning. Personally, I very much still appreciate the practice, along with my collection of eyeliner pens. I currently have like four black ones on the go for reasons. If you don't believe me, here are the two I have on me that I used to touch up this makeup with before I started talking to them. But what you might not have known was that crocodile dung mixed with donkey's milk was used by Cleopatra as a face mask. She also famously bathed in milk with rose petals for hours, which like, honestly, goals. Cheeks were blushed up using a mixture of clay and crushed beetles, which was something also done later on by Queen Elizabeth I to get her memorable red lips. One of the most popular cosmetic ingredients in ancient Greece was olive oil. According to legend, a Greek cook named Calamus invented soap by mixing olive oil with wood ash from Mount Sapo, so it could be used for cleaning utensils at sacrifices. However, when he washed his hands with this mixture, his skin became soft and smooth. It was clear that olive oil had cleansing and beautifying properties. So you're telling me that my big fat Greek wedding lied to me about Greeks using Windex for everything? Curse you, Hollywood. In fifth place, we have a dimple machine. In the 1930s, dimples were considered to be one of the most beautiful accessories any gal could have, leading to Isabel Gilbert inventing the dimple machine in 1936, which promised to give you dimples. This contraption, also referred to as the dimpler, consisted of a chin strap that held two soft rubber dimple indenters in place, one on each cheek. The strap had a coil that created pressure and was described as very uncomfortable and uh, the dimples left your face within a few hours anyways. Jeepers, I guess a lot of folks really wanted to look like Shirley Temple, which is fair. She was pretty adorable. I feel like nowadays, thanks to the interwebs, we have a lot more folks that we can decide that we want to look like. Personally, I'm a mix of wanting to look like my celebrity crush and a brat doll, or a Barbie, depending on the day. In fourth place, we have hair secrets. Alrighty, Let's spin the wheel to see where we're starting with this one. Ah, Greece. Alrighty, to achieve blonde hair, which was highly coveted, women would drench their hair in vinegar to bleach it, which would lead to, you know, hair loss and thus the popularity of wigs. Something I didn't know before today was that in ancient Egypt, only women from higher classes were allowed to have long hair, and slave women had to cut their hair very short, and the hair cut off was often used for making headpieces for the aristocrats. Before hairspray was invented, women used to use lard to keep their huge wigs in place. There were many times when rats jumped on women's wigs from the smell of the lard. Okay, that's a big no for me. Sure, I attract the occasional flies with the amount of hairspray that I wear when I curl my hair, but that's plenty. Modern sidebar. During the World War II days, women had to make deal without wax and used sandpaper to remove unwanted body hair. Yeah, I'm shuddering. In third place, we have Roman makeup. So the Romans attributed great power to cosmetics. Cosmetics first used in ancient Rome for ritual purposes were just part of daily life. Some fashionable cosmetics, such as those imported from Germany, Gaul, and China, were so expensive that the Lex Opia tried to limit their use in around 189 BCE. These designer brands spawned cheap knockoffs that were sold to poorer women. Working class women could afford the cheaper varieties, but may not have had the time to apply the makeup, as the use of makeup was a time consuming affair because cosmetics needed to be reapplied several times a day due to weather conditions and poor composition. Cosmetics were applied in private, usually in a small room where men did not enter. Cosmete, female slaves that adorned their mistresses, were especially praised for their skills. They would beautify their mistresses with the cultus, the Latin word encompassing makeup, perfume, and jewelry. Scent was also also an important factor of beauty. Women who smelled good were presumed to be healthy. Due to the stench of many of the ingredients used in cosmetics at the time, women often drenched themselves in copious amounts of perfume. Romans believed that the smoke from the burning ambergris would make women more attractive. Ergo, ambergris was typically used in face powders for this reason. Another trick involved sitting over straw fires to make hair shine, or sleeping in a vase filled with red chicken fluid to make it thicker. If that wasn't gross enough, urine was included in facial masks that women used to look clean and beautiful. They also used urine to whiten their teeth as well. Mm. Hard pass. 
In second place, we have the uses of baths. Nowadays, I know I personally love a good bath to relax, you know, aching muscles or just decompress. But history wasn't always that way. Vapor baths have been described as similar to a modern day sauna, with unknown vapors that claim to cure all kinds of ailments. Sadly, the Victorian era bath ended up burning more people than actually curing them. Next up, we have the crocodile feces bath. The Greeks and Romans apparently found the best way to fight wrinkles and lines was by collecting the feces of the crocodile and having a bath in it. Apparently, it reduced aging to quite an extent. I'll uh, stick with my Epsom salts and uh, lush bath bombs. Thanks! In first place, we have methods of obtaining pale skin. I'm very grateful that my Snow White complexion is quite natural, thanks to my German Irish mutt heritage, but for those who wanted it, here are some ways not to do it. Going back to using olive oil for everything, apparently, if you combine it with white lead, it can be used to lighten the skin tone. Although this made people's faces visibly lighter, the women who did this were also subjected to death by slow lead poisoning, which was, you know, absorbed into their skin. Lead used to be used for a lot of makeup, and while it was efficient, it was also pretty dang deadly. Speaking of deadly, around the 6th century, an aristocratic woman, in a haste to develop that pale, death like pallor, which was very famous in those times, used to drain their bodies of all their red fluid, one drop at a time. Well, then, that explains why everyone was so weak and tired all the time. But geez, don't waste that elixir. Make sure you're donating it to your friendly neighborhood vampires. A common way to remove freckles and tans and achieve that flawless pale complexion was by using lemon juice mixed with sugar and borax on the face in the 1890s. And once again, for that eternal facial glow and skin bleaching, more modern women would wear a face mask taped to their faces while they slept. I would never be able to sleep if I tried that. In less lethal practices, those geisha women I mentioned before used rice flour powder based paste as a foundation. Hey, now that's something I feel like I could try and not risk my health with. And that brings us to the end of our time once again. While I've definitely put some questionable stuff on my face in the name of fashion or, you know, art, I don't think I've ever put anything like life threatening on my skin. Just a lot of dirt and airbrush. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice. I made a rhyme. And one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night. And feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, 
Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the great stink. Yeah, the great stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They had to soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head. A brilliant play. Might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket enjoying the view just over yonder? when all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruined the vibes. And now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel, and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile would get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey would get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work. Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. To some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. Number three, red dead bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically, the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two. Ancient socks. 
Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays and let me tell you, still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg. A little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now. I'm gonna go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risks of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with them, sure, it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory. I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst. You gotta get up, walk down that long, scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes if you were feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history, you're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she'd put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, slowly you understand. 
Number seven, Victorian Laundry Day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when Laundry Day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee-pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. And a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, hmm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. 
No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad. I can't lie. It does. And it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body. And then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that stuff, turpentine, turpentines, all the time and teens, just all in there washing it out. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days. That's a long time. But around day 40, you would stuff it with sand. Now come day 70, finally, that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits forever, really. And then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber. Now it's, we don't do it, it's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars, we don't stuff anyone with sand. We should, you know what, we should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it, I think it's time. Yeah.